<clears throat> Hello, guys. Nice to see you. So, just a sh quick reminder of our uh, which we discussed. Uh, So last time we considered the uh, diffraction and uh, with diffraction, we understand the interaction of light uh, electromagnetic waves with some uh, obstacles, either uh, like small slits, holes in opaque uh, plate or some uh, small uh, objects in front of the uh, electromagnetic wave. So if the, their uh, size is comparable to the wavelengths, uh, then we can consider, um, for instance, a slit uh, as a source of a point source of uh, light. And uh, then, uh, rules of ray optics doesn't uh, um, don't apply anymore, and that means uh, light will spread in those areas, which, according to ray optics, should have uh, remained in the dark. Uh, so, uh, when we have one slit diffraction, we consider uh, the slit and divide it in many uh, parts and uh, consider each uh, point uh, of this slit as uh, itself as a source of uh, uh, electromagnetic um, spherical uh, point source of electromagnetic waves. Uh, so in that case, they will interfere with each other. And that is the uh, like nature of diffraction effect, it's actually interference of uh, electromagnetic waves generated from different uh, uh, parts, like points of um, the slit, which we consider, and also uh, we need to keep in mind that there will be certain, there should be certain distance between, uh, specific distance between these uh, points, which we consider as a sphere uh, sources of point sources of sphere electromagnetic waves, uh, which will uh, eventually um, correspond to uh, conditions of destructive or uh, constructive uh, interference. So if we have two slits, um, then we have diffraction uh, and uh, uh, two slit interference effects. And in this case, uh, we need to uh, consider both effects. Uh, so the diffraction from each of the um, slit uh, and also interference of uh, uh, light originated from each uh, from like both slits and uh, consider the difference, past difference, uh, in order to see which kind of interference we will get constructive or destructive uh, at the screen where this image is projected. This interference and diffraction uh, pattern uh, patterns are uh, projected. So in general, uh, we will get some um, interference uh, pattern, which is uh, kind of constrained uh, as like envelope uh, by the diffraction pattern. Uh, so that is uh, a more uh, complicated uh, picture, which we discussed last time in more details. So this is uh, just a short reminder of our previous material. Uh, so we also had some 
equations which wanted to describe light intensity distribution as a function of angle uh, position uh, when we have such uh, two slit diffraction. Uh, so it means we consider diffraction and the slit and in addition two slit interference uh, effect. Uh, so today we uh, continue uh, with this uh, topic uh, with the diffraction because we need to define what is uh, angular resolution of some um, uh, optical instruments. Uh, so we will try to understand what uh, is the uh, proper condition for resolving two objects as separate, not as merging together in our image because of the diffraction uh, effect and that originates from the wave nature of, of light. Um, and also we will discuss uh, polarization uh, uh, effects uh, in light. So let us maybe change the camera and uh, I would like to share also my screen. Okay, so uh, because of diffraction, as we understand already, uh, it's impossible to get uh ideally sharp image uh, an object we will always will have some uh, diffraction pattern where which consists of a bright uh, central spot which has the maximum in the middle and gradually intensity decreases uh, like shown uh, here for instance uh, and uh, there will be some minima and diffraction minima and maxima. However, uh, uh, we are mostly interested in the uh, central diffraction uh, uh, peak, which is the brightest and most uh, uh, visible feature of the uh, image. Uh, so the ability of optical system to distinguish uh, between uh, closely spotted uh, object is limited because of the uh, wave nature of light and in to be more particular uh, because of diffraction. So when <coughs> central uh, maximum uh, for incidence in the position. Uh, if we look here, for instance, so if this, uh, so the distance between two sources, angular distance, this theta, um, describes how far they they are located from each other, uh, and. Uh, in the field of view of the current observer. And uh, when they are quite far away from each other, then it's not uh, a problem to distinguish between both of them because we have this bright uh, central diffraction uh, peaks uh, far enough so we can see that these are two, ob two separate objects. However, <clears throat> there is certain condition uh, when the central maximum of the image falls on the first minimum uh, of the uh, other image. So we have central maximum of one image, central maximum of another image. Then we see that here, um, Central maximum falls into the central, uh, into the first minimum uh, of the other image. In this case, this is the condition of uh, so called just resolved 
uh, two objects. So we see that we have two objects here, the same objects as uh, on the image uh, from the uh, shown in the left. Mm, it's clearly seen that there are two objects, but they already quite significantly overlap. We cannot resolve some features of these uh, objects because they overlap with each other, but we still can identify that there are two uh, separate uh, objects. And then if this condition, if the angular uh, distance between uh, two objects is smaller in order to satisfy this condition when the first maximum of the diffraction of one image um, falls into the uh, first minimum of the other image, then we see these uh, two objects as uh, just one uh, spot. And we cannot say anything um, about the fine structure of this image because these uh, two objects are just uh, overlap. <clears throat> so the uh, this spot looks uh, brighter than each of the separate uh, images, but that is just because we kind of um, add up two signals in the same area. So they, that's why it appears brighter, but uh, it doesn't uh, bring us any information about uh, two separate objects, just one. So that is the main limiting factor. And uh, uh, it is most uh, critical in uh, optical telescopes uh, because it is necessary to observe uh, objects which are located very far away uh, from the Earth and uh, uh, the angular uh, distance between them would be very small. So we want to, um, from one side, we want to collect as much light as possible because we want to uh, have good exposure and uh, collect enough light to uh, allow detectors, photo detectors, to uh, detect that there are, there are some objects uh, emitting light. And from other side, it could be possible that uh, we have large enough aperture but uh, to, to see the object, but uh, we cannot investigate its fine structure because of the diffraction uh, limitations. So what is um, good about this is that uh, we definitely need to, uh, in order to solve these uh, two problems, we need larger apertures. So uh, the condition, let's us consider first the condition for the um, minimum resolution um, for the for a slit. And then we can write the equation which is designed for more uh, commonly used uh, spherical, uh, sorry, uh, like round, um, Holes which are used in the uh, observatory uh, telescopes. So it's just some tube and the cross section is a uh, disc and not some slit. Uh, so uh, let me stop sharing this screen. And we know that the first minimum uh, in a single slit diffraction uh, occurs at the angle for which the following condition is true. And this is sinus theta is equal to lambda over A. So lambda is the uh, valence and uh, A is the width of the sleep. So this is the condition for the 
uh, location of the first minimum. And uh, since the requirement for just uh, so-called just result means that the maximum uh, of the diffraction pattern should of one object uh, should uh, fall into the diffraction first diffraction minimum of the image of the other object means that this actually is automatically the condition for the minimum angular resolution. So uh, sinus theta minimum is equal. Usually this theta is quite small because we uh, are operating at the lower limit. So we can write that this is closely, like approximately equal just to theta minimum equals to lambda divided by A. So this is the condition uh, of angular uh, distance between two objects under which uh, we still can resolve, not ideally, but just resolve the uh, appearance of two objects in, in the image. Um, and if this condition will not be satisfied already, if this angular distance between two objects will be smaller than this, uh, given by this ratio, lambda divided by A, then they will appear in the image as just single uh, <clears throat> point, which doesn't bring any information about the structure of the uh, system of bodies and the observation. So um, since uh, uh, we deal more with circular apertures, because of telescopes and other optical instruments, um, then it is possible to uh, do the calculations. There is just the same actually um, equation, which of course deals with not the width of the slit, but with the diameter of the circular aperture. And there is some numerical coefficient. So um, this minimum angular resolution <coughs> or uh, spherical aperture is given as 1.22 times lambda divided by d, where d is diameter of the circular aperture. <coughs> so uh, <coughs> usually uh, ground-based telescopes, they never reach this diffraction limit. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is scattering of light in the atmosphere of our planet uh, because of fluctuations of temperature. Uh, um, light is uh, scattered and that causes like blurring the uh, image. Uh, and uh, usually it's within like one second of angular distance uh, already is at the larger magnification, the smaller angular distances we want to uh, observe, the more this blurring uh, occurs because of um, thermal fluctuations, like scattering of light at thermal fluctuations uh, while it passing through the atmosphere. Uh, so here is uh, some Mm, like two images of the same system uh, made with uh, ground-based telescope and space-based uh, telescope Hubble. So nevertheless, ground-based telescope has larger uh, aperture, uh, significantly larger aperture than uh, Hubble telescope, which is like 2.5 uh, uh, meters only. Uh, the image of Pluto and its satellite Aron uh, looks like some uh, blurred spot. We can kind of notify that, uh, notice here that 
that there is some bigger and, and smaller object next to each other. However, this is just a limit of, of just resolving the uh, presence of two objects. Um, at the same time, we have way uh, better uh, quality of the image obtained by space telescope uh, Hubble, which uh, does not suffer from this uh, light scattering effects in atmosphere. And then it can operate at the limit of like of its, its diffraction limit. Uh, so actually, um, which is defined by the aperture of the telescope. <clears throat> so nowadays, uh, quite soon, hopefully, will be launched a new space uh, telescope, uh, James Webb uh, Space Telescope, which is designed to work in more in infrared uh, region. And its diameter is way larger. It's 7.5 uh, meters. So it's a huge step uh, forward in terms of observatory uh, uh, astronomy. So we will definitely get a uh, very good and high quality uh, images. However, <coughs> it is necessary to mention that there are techniques which can almost uh, eliminate the parasitic effect of atmosphere, the so-called uh, active adaptive optics. Um, so based on the uh, analyzing light from some uh, test uh, star or artificially kind of ignited stars uh, in uh, upper layers of atmosphere by powerful lasers. Uh, in the field of view, it is possible to uh, kind of monitor the scattering influence of atmosphere online and uh, continuously uh, change the curvature of uh, the mirror in order to compensate this uh, scattering effects like optically in the system compensate the scattering effects um, with uh, miniature actuators uh, which locally change the curvature of the surface of the mirror and that automatically uh, in online regime uh, supported by uh, some computational power of uh, dedicated computers uh, can uh, compensate blurring effect of atmosphere. Uh, not 100%, obviously. However, it can make a huge uh, improvement of the image we get. And uh, nowadays, under construction is this extremely large uh, telescope in Atacama Desert in Chile. Uh, <clears throat> designed and uh, constructed by uh, European Space Agency uh, with the diameter of the main mirror of 39 meters. That is really insane, uh, uh, insanely large uh, mirror, which will uh, give unprecedented uh, capabilities for uh, observ observatory uh, astronomy in the nearest future. Hopefully it will be finished within the next uh, five years. Okay, now we proceed further with the diffraction. And uh, we need to discuss the diffraction rating. So uh, diffraction rating is a useful device for analysis of light uh, sources, uh, which consists of a large number of uh, equally spaced parallel slits. So as shown here, we have equally spaced slits uh, where, uh, which are, illuminated from one side 
with uh, electromagnetic waves, then uh, these slits serve as uh, light sources and uh, light from each of these uh, slits um, interfere with light uh, emitted by other slit uh, in different positions, like angular positions, we get different conditions for uh, constructive or destructive interference. So since we have so many slits, uh, we remember with the increase of number of slits due to uh, like interference effects at more than one, uh, more than two slits, um, the main peak, which corresponds to bright uh, fringes, um, increases in intensity and decreases in the width, so it becomes intense and intense and sharp. And um, we get plenty of secondary peaks, but their intensities uh, decrease with the increase of number of states. And since we have uh, really a lot of uh, slits, usually commercially available diffracting gratings uh, possess about uh, like 5,000 uh, slits or uh, graves if these are uh, uh, diffraction gratings, which are working not in transmission, but reflecting mode. Uh, so we have uh, very, very low intensity here in between this uh, intense and sharp peaks. So this is the picture for mm, uh, monochromatic illumination. Uh, however, what is interesting about uh, this diffracting uh, uh, great, uh, gratings, uh, if we have uh, white light or like light originated from some light source, which consists of different wavelengths, then uh, this condition uh, for uh, constructive and de destructive uh, interference, which is based on the uh, pass uh, difference for uh, rays originated from uh, neighboring slits, like actually all these slits simultaneously, uh, <clears throat> will be different for different wavelengths. And uh, positions of constructive interference of different uh, wavelengths uh, as the screen where we project the image, uh, this interference pattern. Uh, the angular positions of this uh, maxima will be uh, different. So we will actually get a, a spectrum of uh, light which hits the diffracting grating. Uh, since we have so many uh, slits in this diffracting grating and uh, the uh, interference maxima are so narrow, uh, it is actually the best optical instrument to uh, split white light into its spectrum and analyze uh, like fine structure of its spectrum. So that's why diffracting ratings are one of the key um, components of uh, spectrometer, like optical uh, spectrometers. So usually they work uh, in a wide spectral range from UV visible and uh, infrared and uh, <coughs> for different uh, wavelength regions, you need to use different um, diffracting gratings with different distance between these um, uh, slits uh, or um, gra gravings, uh, like gr grooves on on the gr uh, grooves on the uh, surface of the uh, reflecting um, diffracting grating, and. Uh, uh, in order to get the highest quality of the uh, obtained spectrum, uh, the highest spectral resolution. 
And so that's why when you go from uh, one spectral range to another, um, either manually or automatically, uh, the system changes the diffracting uh, grating to the uh, uh, that one which is designed specifically for this particular wavelength region uh, where you want to uh, split the incident light into spectrum and see what uh, uh, from what this light consists of from which wavelengths that is very important in order to uh, distinguish between like uh, to understand what is composition of the object which emits light because each molecules uh, they have their specific uh, vibrational uh, uh, modes in uh, this uh, infrared region and uh, based on their spectrum you can uh, tell what is the chemical composition uh, also if it's realized in some uh, spectrometer embedded with uh, within a uh, uh, Raman spectrometer uh, then it's possible to uh, investigate the structure the crystalline structure of objects uh, and so on. So definitely is spectroscopy is optical spectroscopy is a very powerful um, scientific technique which allows to um, get a lot of information about uh, material uh, uh, composition, structure and uh, uh, properties. So <clears throat> now our uh, one more topic which we're going to discuss is uh, polarization of light. So it is known that uh, if we consider some electromagnetic wave, we have uh, electric field vector, magnetic field vector, which are uh, varying in uh, perpendicular uh, planes. So magnetic field vector is changing in the Uh, plane ZX uh, and uh, electromagnetic uh, ele electric field vector is changing in the plane uh, YX. Uh, so X is the direction of uh, traveling of electromagnetic wave and uh, elect uh, vectors of magnetic and electric field, they vary in uh, directions perpendicular to the direction of traveling of this electromagnetic wave. <clears throat> so um, uh, the direction of polarization of each individual wave, electromagnetic wave, is defined uh, to the direction of uh, in, a direction in which the electric field vector is vibrating. So if we look at this image, for instance, then we can say, OK, uh, direction uh, defined by axis. Uh, y is uh, the uh, direction of polarization of this wave because uh, electric field vector is uh, vibrating in the direction of, ac of uh, axis uh, Y. Uh, <coughs> however, this is just one separate example for electromagnetic wave. But when we have uh, irradiation of electromagnetic waves with some materials. Uh, <clears throat> there are plenty of uh, different uh, electric uh, dipoles originated from like molecules of this uh, material or atoms. Uh, and uh, they, because of different orientation, uh, they uh, emit uh, light with uh, different polarization. So when we get some uh, light emitted by a uh, number of uh, electric uh, dipoles, uh, means many molecules or atoms, uh, then we get random polarization for this electromagnetic waves, so they are polarized in all uh, directions uh, 
from zero to 360 degrees. So that could be depicted with such an image where we see that uh, light has uh, uh, consists of electromagnetic waves with different uh, direction of polarization. Um, if there is only one single direction of polarization, like on this image, then it's called uh, that this light is linearly polarized. And uh, <clears throat> there are two uh, possible, um, was, uh, more, but like two uh, most uh, common uh, ways to polarize uh, light. So one is more uh, um, engineering based. So you need to uh, either find some uh, natural uh, materials which possess this, which are uh, optic active, uh, optically active materials which can change the uh, polarization of light uh, or make them uh, artificially. Uh, it should so-called uh, polarizers. And uh, <clears throat> usually it should be some aligned uh, uh, threads of uh, conjugated polymers where electrons can move uh, in uh, along the chains of these uh, polymers and uh, cannot move perpendicularly from one molecule to another. Uh, in that case, if we hit such uh, polarizer with uh, normal light, which consists of all possible uh, polarization angles, then based on the position of so-called transmission uh, axis, uh, only in this direction, which coincides with the transmission axis, uh, which is actually along these chains, like polymer chains, uh, where electrons can um, oscillate in response to being excited by incident uh, light with random polarization. Uh, only that light, uh, which uh, has the same polarization as the direction of the transmission axis um, can be absorbed and re-emitted by these vibrating electrons along the chains. Uh, and uh, that's why only that light can pass through such polarizer. And then if we have another polarizer, like the same polarizer as the first one, and change the angle, uh, this angle theta, which is the angle between position of the uh, transmission axis at the first polarizer and transmission axis at the uh, second polarizer, we can change light intensity of uh, already polarized light, which uh, goes through such system of two polarizers aligned with respect to each other and can be detected by the observer. So there, here is a simple equation which relates the angle between the transmission axis of these two um, polarizers and the maximum uh, intensity of polarized light, which already passed through the first polarizer and is approaching the second one. So in this case, we can first uh, polarize the linearly polarize the uh, incident light. And then with the second polarizer can uh, manipulate with its uh, intensity, like with the transmission, um, because it will be dependent on the um, orientation of the second polarizer with the first, with respect to the first one. So this um, is usually used in uh, some uh, optical instruments. Uh, however, there is another very uh, common. Uh, um, option for polarization. It's so-called uh, uh, polarization by reflectance. So uh, when we have some incident light with random polarization, here we see two polarization directions. One polarization in the plane of accident of this uh, 
rays of this ray and reflected ray, and also one in uh, perpendicular. This dot shows the uh, polarization in the direction perpendicular to the plane of accidents. So <clears throat> if we arrange the uh, angle of accidents, uh, of, oh, sorry, of in, uh, the angle of incidents uh, in that way that we have right angle uh, between the refracted and reflected uh, rays, uh, that condition will, uh, this angle will depend on the uh, ideality coefficients of the first and second medium, uh, which forms this interface. Um, and this is the condition, so tangents of um, uh, theta, uh, when this is realized, when refractive and reflective reflected uh, rays form right angle uh, is equal to the ratio between uh, refractive index of the second medium to the refractive index of the first medium. <clears throat> so this angle is called uh, Brewster angle, and this uh, condition is called like Brewster's uh, law. Uh, <clears throat> so if uh, we realize such a um, Mm. condition, then the uh, reflected uh, light uh, will be fully polarized in the direction perpendicular to the plane of the incidence. Uh, the refracted light will be partially polarized uh, in the direction uh, uh, which is uh, parallel to the uh, plane of incidence. And uh, this is happening because of the uh, nature of uh, electron dipoles emit uh, light. So we need to consider like two steps. First, we need to consider some uh, absorption and re emission of. Uh, light uh, of incident light in two beams, uh, which is refracted and reflected beam. And uh, uh, taking into account the uh, features of how uh, electric dipole emits uh, light, if you recall, we considered previously uh, electric, uh, so, sorry, this uh, dipole antenna, and uh, it was shown that dipole antenna emits uh, in directions perpendicular to its axis. Uh, so it doesn't uh, uh, emit parallel to, its, uh, to, to itself. So it emits in the direction perpendicular to the dipole antenna. So that is also true for uh, electric dipoles, which are the uh, actually, actual emitters of electromagnetic waves. Um, they do not emit in the direction parallel to the dipole moment. And uh, uh, taking into account this feature, uh, we, when we have such a condition, when refracted and reflected light uh, are arranged uh, at right angle to each other, uh, then we uh, get fully um, polarized uh, reflected light uh, and partially polarized, polarized, uh, polarized uh, refracted light. Uh, so it should be noted that uh, this effect can be easily observed in nature because uh, any reflected light is partially uh, polarized. Uh, however, if this angle of incidence is equal to the Brewster's angle, this reflected light is completely polarized. 
And in that case, uh, it is, uh, for instance, quite uh, useful to wear this uh, polarized sunglasses, which can uh, significantly uh, reduce uh, flickering of reflected light from, um, uh, for instance, wet asphalt, uh, because uh, part of this light is polarized and with right alignment of the polarized uh, po po polarizer embedded in these sunglasses, um, it is possible to cut the majority of this reflected uh, light and uh, um, make it more comfortable for uh, driving without reducing uh, a signal from, from uh, other objects. Uh, also, uh, polarized filters are used in photography. Uh, for instance, when we have some uh, reflection from the water surface and you want to make a photo with some depths of vision inside the water and see the, the uh, if it's not deep water to see the and clean, you want to see the uh, bottom of the uh, river or a lake, uh, then it is necessary to do something with the reflection because reflection overexpose this uh, the detector or the detector, and uh, then uh, you just see uh, some bright reflection on the surface of uh, water, but you cannot see deeper in in water uh, on this picture. Then then it's useful to use also this uh, polarized. Uh, filters uh, and uh, they can significantly reduce the uh, reflection, the intensity of this reflection from the water surface uh, because part of this light will be uh, polarized in the same direction. And then it's possible to see kind of deeper in water and uh, what is going on in the water. Uh, without overexposing the uh, uh, detector of the camera. Okay, thank you for attention. This is pretty much everything what we uh, should discuss on uh, wave optics. And uh, this is pretty much the end of the course. Uh, that material which uh, is uh, designed for this uh, course. So uh, if you have any questions, you're welcome to contact me anytime and uh, <clears throat> prepare for uh, the uh, final exam, which will be this Saturday. So it will include all topics for um, material which we already discussed in our course from electricity to wave optics and uh, um, take care and good luck bye bye have a good evening <laughs>